Hey everyone, this week we are talking about collaboration information systems. Uh, we'll talk mostly about collaboration throughout all of this, and then we'll spend some time at the very end talking about how information systems can actually help benefit collaborative groups. So how you can use information systems to ensure that collaboration is happening and make that process of collaboration as effective as possible. And the idea with all of this is helping whatever group you're working with, whatever goal you're trying to accomplish as a group, helping all of you succeed through the use of information systems. So let's get into it. So I wanna start out by talking about the definition of collaboration that we're going to be working under. This is the definition of collaboration that the book provides. Um, and it also takes care to try to compare and contrast cooperation with collaboration because they have a lot of similarities, but there are some key differences that separate collaboration out from cooperation. The similarities between cooperation and collaboration are that they both involve a group of people working together to accomplish a common goal, which is an incredibly, incredibly important skill when it comes to actually accomplishing tasks in life. It's important to be able to work together with people in order to make sure that everything you know, that we want to get done as a group can actually get done that cooperation or collaboration is important to make achieving tasks so much easier. Some would even say that uh, it's the reason why humanity has come this far. A lot of anthropologists are saying that our ability to work together uh, is really important to how we've been able to make it this far. So, Cooperation and collaboration by themselves are really important. However, there are some differences that separate collaboration out from cooperation that define collaboration as a specific type of cooperation that really make collaboration itself very special and very useful. While cooperation can refer to any type of just groups of people working together to accomplish a common goal, collaboration specifically involves the mechanics of feedback and iteration in order to create a better product or create a better workflow or all that kind of stuff. If you're trying to accomplish some kind of goal, collaboration will, in will involve, you know, making progress towards that goal, the group members making progress towards that goal, but then taking the time to give feedback to other members of the group to say, hey, you know, this is good. Uh, here are some things that you could do better in this case, but here are some things that you did really, really well in this case. And then taking that feedback and using that to improve the work that each member has done, doing that over and over and over, iterating through that process, when I say iterating, I mean repeating that loop of do work towards the goal, get feedback, improve, do work towards the goal, get feedback, improve, and so on and so forth. That, that loop of getting feedback and improving is what makes collaboration collaboration. That's what separates it out from regular cooperation. And collaboration often relies on different perspectives of group members because, you know, no two people are going to think exactly the same, which is why it's so valuable to get feedback from other people who might see the work that you've done and interpret it in maybe a different way, process it in maybe a different way, notice something that you might not have noticed. This uh, different perspectives part is really, really important for making a better product, for doing better work to achieve a common goal. A diverse group of people who all have different 
mindsets and different uh, experiences, you know, different levels of expertise in different subjects, all that kind of stuff is going to work a lot better. They're going to they're going to work better in a collaborative environment than a group of 20 clones, let's say, of the exact same person. Maybe they'll be able to get work done just fine, but then when it comes to the actual feedback and iteration processes, uh, 20 clones of one person, if they all have the same kind of experience going into this, might not be able to provide good feedback. So the different perspectives of group members is really important, important here. I want to give an example of cooperation and collaboration. Give an example of cooperation that is not collaboration versus an example of collaboration. So one example of cooperation that isn't collaboration, uh, let's say my partner and I are cooking a meal together, which we try to do sometimes. Um, it's really nice to be able to cook together. It makes cooking a lot fun and it makes the whole process quite a bit easier for the both of us rather than one of us having to cook at a time. So there are times where we both try to set the, set the time aside to cook together. And when we're cooking, we'll typically divide everything up into different tasks. So tasks like uh, let's say if we're making burgers together, uh, tasks would be like um, cooking the actual burgers themselves, preparing some of the toppings for the burgers, preparing the buns and getting condiments on there, all that kind of stuff. Um, actually assembling everything when all the ingredients are done, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, one person doing the entire process by themselves, sure, there's some amount of multitasking you could possibly do. For example, when I cook burgers by myself, I will get the meat on the, um, well, I don't really have a grill, so I use a, a cast iron pan. I'll get the meat on the pan, get that cooking, and then start preparing my toppings or start uh, putting condiments on the buns, um, all that kind of stuff, tending to the meat when I need to, but, you know, getting everything ready for the actual final assembly so that as soon as the burgers come off the pan, I'm able to have everything ready to go. I can just put the burger right on, the actual patty right on, have the burger assembled, and yeah, everything is great. But when we work together, what we're able to do is uh, my partner can actually get the meat on the pan at the same time as I start, as I, uh, me starting to chop my ingredients. So I get all the toppings and stuff, you know, chopped up. I chop up the onions. Uh, if we're doing mushrooms on the burgers that particular day, I'll chop up the mushrooms as well, get those ready, ready so that my uh, partner can put them in the pan whenever she wants to. You know, all that kind of stuff. And while I'm doing that, she might be actually grabbing things like the buns and condiments and putting them close to me so that I'm able to actually start preparing the buns as soon as all the toppings are done. And while all that's going on, um, you know, I chop up all the toppings, I, I get the uh, containers ready for the actual uh, vegetables that I chop up for the extra burgers that we might have left over, all that kind of stuff. So we have all these tasks that we break up. We do our own multitasking, right? We are working together to accomplish the common goal of making burgers for dinner and also maybe having some leftovers as well. That's all well and good. But you'll notice through all of that that we're not really applying the feedback and iteration side of things. I might be asking like, hey, do you have a preference on how thick I cut these onions? Or 
she might be asking, how big do you want the burgers to be? Like, do you want them thick or do you want smash burgers? Or something like that, right? But that's not so much feedback as input. And input is a little bit different here because it's not like I'm taking already existing work. I'm not taking a look at her burger and providing constructive criticism. More on that in a second. And then she uses that to make, you know, changes with how she's doing the next burger or anything like that. Um, that's not really involved in this kind of process, nor does it need to be because she makes amazing burgers. So nothing to worry about there. But yeah, that would be an example of cooperation without collaboration. Now, my partner and I have also collaborated. Um, an example of collaboration here would be my partner is a musician. Uh, she's very good, and it's actually one of the reasons why we're dating right now is that I found out she was a musician and wanted to talk to her about it, and here we are. Uh, but, you know, she goes through a lot of work, actually, making music, as you do as a musician. I have a bit of a music background. I, I don't actually produce music myself, but I did a lot of work um, as a kid learning music theory and all that kind of stuff. Whereas my partner is self-taught, and she's very good at what she does, but one of the things that she hasn't had the chance to learn as much as she's wanted to is music theory. So we have these different perspectives where she has the knowledge of how to actually make a song, actually go from the very beginning to the end in creating a song, which is very impressive because that is so hard to do. On the other hand, I have my knowledge of music theory. I can make sometimes some interesting sounding chord progressions using music theory as a little bit of influence, but I have no way of actually putting a whole song together myself. And the way that we can actually collaborate in some work is uh, I can sometimes show off a neat sounding chord progression to my partner who will get inspired and start thinking of the music that uh, she would be able to create that would in some way use that kind of chord progression. And we actually start going through the feedback and iteration loop right there where she has this idea of what she's looking for and we're communicating about it. She can talk about what she thinks is really interesting about the chord progression, uh, what might make things a little bit tricky to work with. And then I can actually take that feedback and change up the chord progression a little bit, make things maybe a little easier. You know, if I made a progression that has a very funky beat and that isn't necessarily something that would be very helpful for the type of end product that we're trying to work towards, um, then I can sort of adjust that. I can adjust how I'm putting notes down in this chord progression uh, based on that feedback and so on and so forth. And in the meantime, uh, while she is working on some of the other pieces of the song as I'm working on this chord progression that I'm getting ready to get recorded and sent over to her. Um, she might, you know, she might be putting together some of the other elements, like some of the bass lines that go along with it or some other pieces that would be happening as the song progresses. And I can take a listen and say, so, you know, I think I, I like what you've done here quite a bit. Um, I think 
you could maybe uh, match it up with this uh, chord progression that you're that we're working with a little bit by making this kind of change here and that might play with things in a really really interesting way uh, and she might be able to take that make that change um, and say like this is really good um, this might be really interesting for the back half of the song where we try to do a change up in order to you know kind of make the song interesting keep the momentum going keep uh having some sort of sense of progression throughout the song um so providing feedback in response to the feedback i'm providing as well so that process of feedback me giving feedback to her her giving feedback to me and so on and so forth uh is really helpful in terms of making a good song and and at the end it's very fun to listen to sometimes so that would be collaboration right there the difference between us cooking together and us making music together when we're cooking we're not providing feedback to each other and we're not iterating on what we're working on in response to feedback whatsoever but when we're making music together, we're providing feedback to each other and we're using that to make a better song. And we iterate through that process where we make changes uh, based on feedback and then we listen in and just start doing a little more work and say, oh, look, you know, maybe here's another place where we could make these changes, uh, make improvements, continue working, all that kind of stuff. That cycle of feedback and and uh, improvement, that constant iteration through the process makes us working together on music collaboration rather than simply cooperation. And of course, the different perspectives of the group members here is our different perspectives of music, our different experiences and the different pools of knowledge that we've built regarding music. Now, I have said the phrase constructive criticism at least once, uh, I'm pretty sure. Constructive criticism is really, really important in the actual feedback part of collaboration. Because when you're giving feedback, it's really important for that feedback to be positive and negative the reason why is because you know you want people to be able to know not just what could use improvement but also what they are doing that is already currently good the good things that they have done in their work and that's not just about you know trying to make sure you're not hurting people's feelings although in a group setting, you don't want to try to hurt people's feelings. That's going to make for a really bad group dynamic and could hamper uh, the actual results of the collaboration. So making sure that people are feeling good about their work is really important. But you also want people to know what they are doing good so that they know to continue doing that good thing. You want to know you want people to know what they're doing right and what they should continue doing throughout whatever work they're doing and what could possibly use some improvement, possibly with a couple suggestions as well. So constructive criticism is this balancing act where you are talking about what's good and what's bad. It is incredibly important to succeeding in a collaborative environment. Feedback itself defines collaboration, but constructive criticism ensures that that collaboration is successful. Because if you get it wrong, if you provide too much positive feedback, if you provide too much negative feedback, if you don't provide enough feedback at all whatsoever, and if you don't do it in a nice, way in a kind way that feedback is not going to be as effective and that 
collaboration is not going to be as effective. Constructive criticism allows group members to revise their individual work, and it produces a refined outcome for that individual work. Uh, in the example that I gave where my partner and I are working on music together, my chord progression that I came up with, uh, I was able to refine it, refi revise and refine it because of the constructive criticism that my partner gave me, both the positive aspects and the negative aspects. And I don't want to say positive and negative in terms of she gave me some feedback in a really happy way and some feedback in a really insulting or negative way or something like that, but more she told me what I was doing that was good from her expertise and what I was doing that was bad also from her expertise. It's not even necessarily that what I was doing was good or bad specifically, but it was more that she found areas that I, you know, I did really well with this particular work and areas in this particular work that could use improvement. I was able to take all of that feedback, you know, take the good parts, the parts that I did well, and store that away in my brain as we continued working on the project and in the future. And I took the uh, aspects that needed improvement, I refined the chord progression that I was working on, and then I also stored that in my brain for the future, and also as we were continuing to work on the project. So, this constructive criticism is extremely, extremely important. You need to talk about both things that people did well and things that could use improvement when you're working in a collaborative environment. And you need to be able to accept that as well in a collaborative environment. That two-part process of giving constructive criticism and receiving constructive criticism is very important for collaborative success. Now the book provides some guidelines for constructive criticism. Uh, some guidelines for giving constructive criticism. You want to be specific. You want to talk about specific points that are good and specific points that could use improvement in the work that you are constructively criticizing. You want to offer suggestions as well, um, especially because constructive criticism is going to come from your place of expertise, the things that you know well, especially if you are working in a diverse group where you are a subject matter expert in something, and truly everyone is a subject matter expert in something in any group. It's just a matter of figuring out what that is. But you want to offer suggestions because, you know, you have noticed something that might need improvement or yeah might need improvement that the other person didn't they didn't notice it so because they didn't notice it they may not know exactly what to do with it so if you just say well this needs improvement they might struggle to actually figure out how to improve it that's where you come in since you've already noticed the thing that might need improvement, you can give suggestions on how they can improve it. So that's a really important piece as well. You don't want to give personal comments in the sense of like, you know, you're really bad at this, or you need to improve at this point or something like that. You would want to give comments along the lines of this thing right here could use this kind of improvement, right? You want to focus more on the work itself than going personally for the, um, the actual person who created the work. Although it is, it can be good to tell someone when they are good 
at doing something. If you notice that they have a particular skill set that they're utilizing well throughout the projects that you're working on with them, it can be good to point out like, hey, I noticed that you use this skill really well. Doing that kind of comment can be really beneficial. So it's good to avoid it when you're talking about places that need improvement, all that kind of stuff. But there are times when it can be appropriate to give that kind of personal comment when you're talking about how well they are utilizing their skills, how knowledgeable they are in certain areas. That kind of personal comment can be helpful and that can contribute to a good team dynamic. So think about it at, you know, th think about it before giving it essentially. And then of course you want to set positive goals. So you want any, any sort of goal that you're setting when you're giving constructive criticism, you know, you would want to say things along the lines of, I think you should be doing this when you're trying to improve your work or something like that, but you want to frame that in a positive light rather than, you know, you should get rid of all this bad stuff that you wrote. Um, it could be, uh, I think focusing on this aspect that you did really well here will be beneficial for what you're trying to work on. So there's that aspect of removal versus as the aspect of focus. Um, right there. The example that they also give for set positive goals in the textbook is you need to stop missing deadlines versus in the future try to budget your time so you can meet the deadline. Um, a positive uh, missing, you know, stop missing deadlines is not positive right there. And even though they do need to stop missing deadlines, um, it's important to be aware of how feelings actually affect group success. Um, saying in the future, try to budget your time so you can meet the deadline is, you know, it, it's not like a happy go lucky. It's not like a, you know, you're doing so good at this. You know, it's not that kind of statement. It's not that kind of positivity. But it's still a positive goal. When you are working collaboratively in a team, this completely relies on teammates being willing to communicate with each other. Teammates have to be willing to accept that kind of criticism. They have to be in a they have to be in a place where it feels safe to accept criticism from other people. And I talk a lot about, you know, not trying to be overly negative in the way that you're saying things. You know, you can give negative feedback, but you shouldn't try to be overly negative in the way that you're saying things. You shouldn't try to say things that might be hurtful. You want to be positive, you want to keep a good energy about, you know, your feedback. You want, you want to treat your team members well, because if you don't, your team members are not going to be receptive to feedback from you. They might listen in feedback periods. They might try to take things to heart and try to do better and all that kind of stuff. They, they might try to push through any bad feelings that they're getting if you're being harsh in your feedback. But fundamentally speaking, harsh feedback closes them off from being able to fully work with that feedback, being able to fully work in the team. And at that point, 
the collaboration starts to crumble. It starts to become cooperation, which may not be enough. So in order to maintain collaboration, it is important to be nice. The job of being nice is not only given to the criticism giver, though. The criticism receiver also has to be nice about how they receive criticism. And one way they can do that is question the emotions that come up during the constructive criticism phase, uh, specifically. I want to specifically say that this question your emotions thing, um, I'm, I'm talking specifically about constructive criticism here, the, the actual feedback phase of uh, collaboration, what I'm saying is question your emotions, um, because I know there are scenarios where people can make you question your emotions and the rationality of everything, and that is unhealthy, and I'm not touching that <laughs> because we're just talking about the um, constructive criticism side of things right here. What I mean by questioning your emotions, if you get a specific emotional response, especially a negative emotional response during the uh, feedback process, it's important to take a step back from your emotion. It can be very easy to let a negative emotion kind of take over and influence what you do and that can be disastrous in a collaborative uh, situation because you know let's say if it's anger and you start to yell at the person who gave you feedback that would be really bad for a collaborative dynamic. I don't think I really have to say that. Um, you're not working together as a team. At that point, you it, it, it be has become a me versus you kind of situation. It's also similar with the um, with crying. If you become really sad during a uh, feedback session or something like that and you start crying in front of the person who gave you that feedback it can make them reluctant to continue giving you feedback and the collaborative environment starts to crumble not to say that you shouldn't ever cry if emotions get really really strong because that's very natural um it, it in that case it would be important to say, hey, I'm sorry, my emotions got the best of me, but I still appreciate your feedback. Please let me take a moment and I'll come back when I'm feeling a little better to continue the feedback process. And that can sort of diffuse the tension right away. But regardless, when I'm talking about questioning your emotions here, um, when you get a certain emotional response from feedback, this idea of questioning your emotions is taking a couple seconds if you need to. If you're currently in a meeting where you are getting feedback, asking for a couple seconds so you could maybe uh, go to the bathroom or step outside for a little bit or something like that. But like taking a couple seconds to process everything, recognizing that, you know, your emotions are valid. There's nothing wrong with feeling the way that you are feeling. But also trying to understand why you're trying, like why you're feeling that way. So not like pushing things down for the sake of having a good working environment, but more just accepting this is how I'm feeling. It's okay for me to feel this way. 
what about that piece of feedback made me feel this way? Why did this hit so strongly in particular? And is there anything I can learn from it so that I, you know, maybe have a better time receiving feedback in the future or so that I have a, so that I can produce better work? I think there's a lot of times in a group scenario where um, you feel really, really good about some work that you did. So then uh, getting a piece of feedback that talks about how you need improvement, especially if it maybe isn't worded the best way, that can feel a bit like a gut punch. So recognizing that it hurts to hear that something that you're really, really proud of still needs improvement, recognizing that that hurts, being okay with the fact that that hurts, and then trying to be okay with the fact that, you know, these two things can live together. It's okay to be proud of your work, and it's okay for your work to still need improvement, because at the very end, once you are able to improve that work, you might feel even more proud about it, because you have a, uh, a much more structurally sound piece of work right there. So that is what I mean by questioning your emotions. It's not disbelieving yourself immediately when you feel something negative in the feedback process. It's not trying to push those emotions down for the sake of maintaining this happy facade. It's none of that. It's trying to understand where the emotions are coming from and seeing if you can use that to become a more effective collaborative group worker. You also don't want to dominate group work. Uh, it can be very tempting to, you know, blurt out every idea that you have, and they might be good ideas, right? It's very valid to have a bunch of ideas come into your head and then want to share them immediately. What you don't want to do is dominate the conversation because everybody, well, everybody deserves to have a chance to speak, right? Not being allowed to speak is awful, frankly. It's really rough to feel like you're not being listened to, especially in a collaborative group like that, or a group that is supposed to be collaborative. And because of that, if one person is dominating group time, people who aren't able to get a word in edgewise are going to feel less valued, and they're not going to work as well in their project, they're, they may not be able, or they may not be able to give effective feedback because, well, if their voice isn't heard in a meeting or stuff like that, then why would their voice be heard when it actually comes to feedback? They might not be willing to accept feedback either because of some, you know, po possibly latent feelings uh, regarding the inability to talk. If they don't feel respected as a group member, then why should they, uh, you know, go out of their way to take that kind of feedback from someone who doesn't respect them, right? Which, yes, it does uh, kind of go against the question your emotions kind of thing that I had just been talking about, but that's the kind of thing where, you know, sometimes... Problems can beget other problems. So domination of group meeting time, group communication time, all that kind of stuff is not helpful. It's not going to produce a good group. And it's always worthwhile to make sure you can, um, you know, that everyone is getting equal time in the collaboration periods of the group work. Um, 
And I'll say, like, I have ADHD. It can be really easy to not kind of be aware of that within myself and to speak too much during a conversation where I, uh, you know, it's not appropriate for me to do that. It's something that takes quite a bit of mental energy um, at times to actually do to make sure that I'm not dominating the conversations and that I'm actively including other people in the conversations if necessary to help make sure that everyone has time to speak. So I'll admit that I personally can struggle with that. It's something that you have to practice. And it's something you have to listen to if someone tells you that you're dominating a situation. I had to listen to it. I had to take the feelings that came up from that, the feelings of shame and sadness and all that kind of stuff, and I had to address those, and I had to be okay that I felt like that, but know that I had to address my tendencies to speak quite a bit in conversation. I had to address that so I wouldn't be making other people feel bad. It's an important skill to build. Whether you have ADHD or not, it is important to make sure that you aren't dominating the conversation and that you are actively including other people in the conversation to make sure everyone has equal participation. Because it's so important for a collaborative group for everyone to have equal participation. Collaboration thrives on people with different perspectives. It thrives on the fact that a collaborative group will have a lot of people that have different experiences. So if you're shutting people out of that, then collaboration falls apart. So it's so important not to dominate a conversation. It is so important to actively make sure that everyone in the group is involved in the conversation, both through monitoring how much time you're taking up and also through actively bringing people into the conversation. And then finally, throughout the feedback process, it's really important to demonstrate a commitment to the group. If you are receiving feedback, it's important to, at the very end, you know, say, hey, thank you for giving me that feedback. Um, and it's important to work that feedback into the actual, you know, work that you're doing. When it's necessary, of course. Um, the textbook talks about a uh, unconstructive versus constructive example here for demonstrating the commitment to the group, where uh, the unconstructive example is, I'm not rewriting this part, it's good enough. The constructive version is, you know, I didn't want to have to redo that, but if you all think it's important, then I will redo it. That is demonstrating a commitment to the group by acknowledging what the group members think is important to do and following through with that. That is committing to the group there. Now, I think there are times where, you know, if you have your expertise in a certain area, because everyone in a group is going to be a subject matter ex expert in something, if you are speaking towards your subject matter expertise and you get feedback that contradicts it, it might be important not to just blindly go through with that feedback because, you know, you're demonstrating a commitment to the group by going through with the feedback, but it might be important to give feedback to that feedback and say, hey, you know, this is my area of expertise. And I appreciate that you gave me this feedback. I can see where you're coming from with this, but I truly think that what I've done is correct based on my knowledge. You know, starting up that conversation. And by starting up that conversation, 
you might be able to either teach your group members something new and show them that, yeah, you know, your work really was, you know, that, that aspect really was correct and that the feedback that they gave might have been a little bit in error. That might be one outcome. Another outcome is that you learn something new yourself that motivated that change, that made you understand, you know, why it does need to be made. And then a third outcome might be that both things happen. Both your group members and you learn something new about that piece of feedback and you're able to come to a good compromise. And you know what that is? That is demonstrating a commitment to the group. Even though you didn't blindly accept that feedback, you are still demonstrating a commitment to the group by trying to make sure that you're doing it right. Because doing it right is the purpose of collaboration. You want to do it right. You want to make the best thing possible. So by working to improve that feedback, by giving feedback to the feedback and figuring everything out there, that is collaborative. That is within the spirit of collaboration. And that is good. You are demonstrating the commitment to the group, not by blindly accepting, not by blindly rejecting, but by opening up the conversation and working through it. And that's really important. So that's collaboration. Collaboration is a group of people working together, using feedback and iteration in order to make the best solution possible to a problem or the best product possible or whatever. You're trying to do your best through the process of feedback and iteration. And we've talked about constructive criticism, which is, uh, which governs how feedback should be given and received in order to best optimize your collaboration. So we, we are going to rely on these terms throughout the rest of this chapter. I mean, they're very important things to talk about on their own. This is probably one of the most important life skills that you could possibly ever have, at least in my experience. Um, it's so important to be able to work collaboratively with a group of people that has very different perspectives from you because that's how you're going to make the best product. But what we're also going to do is we are going to use these terms to further motivate our discussion of collaboration and then talk about collaborative information systems, information systems that help benefit collaboration. So that's what we're going to do throughout the next bunch of videos.